National parks have been called America's best idea. They make up a combined 84 million acres of land. If they were all connected, they would be the fifth biggest state in the country. They contain some of the world's tallest waterfalls, some of the hottest temperatures ever recorded, and some of the largest living things. But how exactly did national parks come into being? Why do we even have them? In this video, we'll be explaining the history of these amazing places. There are 63 protected areas in the United States known as national parks. An act of Congress is required in order to create a new national park. Generally speaking, they are picked for their natural beauty, unique landscape, ecosystems, or just fun recreational activities like fishing. National monuments are different in that they are selected for their historical significance. 30 of the 50 states have national parks. American Samoa and the U.S. Virgin Islands also have national parks. The National Park of American Samoa is the newest park, created in 1987 by Ronald Reagan. California holds a record for most national parks with nine, closely followed by Alaska, which has eight. Gateway Arch National Park in Missouri has the distinction of being the smallest park at just 192 acres. The biggest national park is Wrangell St. Elias in Alaska, which spans over 8 million acres of land. That's bigger than all nine of the smallest states. Alaska is kind of the king of big national parks, since the next three biggest parks are also in Alaska. The national parks are also pretty popular. In 2017, they set a record for visitation with 84 million total visitors. That means a quarter of the U.S. population visited a national park at some point that year. Great Smoky Mountains National Park in North Carolina and Tennessee is the most happening park of them all. It's gotten the most visitors every year since 1944. The Appalachian Trail goes right through it. Surprisingly, Grand Canyon National Park is only the second most popular national park. I guess there really must be something going on in the Smoky Mountains, since you think that the Grand Canyon would be the biggest draw in the country. The least visited national park in America is Gates of the Arctic National Park and Preserve. In 2019, it got a measly 10,000 visitors. The park, which is bigger than the whole country of Belgium, is probably unpopular because it's located entirely within the Arctic Circle. This location is slightly inconvenient for Americans who happen to live south of Canada. An artist named George Catlin is thought to be the first person to use the term National Park back in 1832. He was traveling across the Great Plains and was worried that the wildlife and the wilderness might be in danger since more and more people were moving west. He wrote, By some great protecting policy of government, in a magnificent park, a nation's park, containing man and beast, in all the wildness, and freshness of their nature's beauty. So typically he said Nations Park, not National Park, but it's close enough. Yellowstone National Park was the first national park, not just in the United States, but in the world. America was ahead of the game when it came to conservation. It was officially explored for the first time in 1869 by Henry D. Washburn and Ferdinand Hayden. Over time, a story evolved about how at the end of their expedition, the two of them were sitting around a campfire and they decided that the area should be dedicated to the public. This is the story that advocates for the National Park would tell. It didn't actually happen, but it sounds good, doesn't it? What could be a more fitting beginning for National Parks than a campfire discussion? They were advocates for the creation of the park, though, and Hayden wrote that if the land wasn't protected, that the vandals who are now waiting to enter into this wonderful land will in a single season despoil beyond recovery. These remarkable curiosities which have required all the cunning skill of nature thousands of years to prepare. The Northern Pacific Railroad Company surprisingly was also one of the groups that wanted the area to be turned into a park. They thought it would make a good destination for a new route they were laying down through Montana. In order to keep out poachers, the Army built a fort in Yellowstone to protect the park. This basic strategy would become the norm for park rangers in the future. Yellowstone National Park is home to the largest supervolcano on the entire continent. Luckily for all nearby humans, it is considered to be dormant. Over half of the world's geysers are in Yellowstone, which is just one of the reasons why it's one of the most popular national parks. The classic park ranger hat that you always see Smokey the Bear wearing came into use around this same time. United States Cavalry units were sent into Yosemite Park in 1891, since at the time the parks department wasn't really big enough to manage everything themselves. These troops wore their campaign hats with two creases in the top, known as the Montana Peak. This would eventually become the standard hat for rangers. The cavalry troops protected the parks not just from poachers, but from illegal miners as well. Many states' fishing game wardens also wear this style of hat now, as do some police officers. 
Personally, I think it looks a lot cooler than your typical police hat. In 1933, the National Park Services, as it functions today, came into being. President FDR signed Executive Order 6166, which, despite having all those sixes in it, didn't do anything creepy or weird. It combined the national parks, national monuments, national military parks, national cemeteries, national memorials, and national capital parks into one big national park system, all to be run by the National Park Service. You might not have even known that those were all different things. FDR's executive order expanded the national park system to include things like the Washington Monument, the Statue of Liberty, and Gettysburg. These things are obviously pretty different from, say, a giant forest, but the idea was that they are all also things that should be available to the public. Between FDR in 1933 and 1964, 71 new areas were added in as national parks. That's a lot of ground to cover. The National Park Service got help from FDR's newly created Civilian Conservation Corps, who helped work on natural resource conservation programs. At its peak, the Corps ran 600 camps and employed 120,000 people. During this era, the parks were starting to have problems. There was a huge backlog of park maintenance that needed to be done, and all kinds of projects that they had never gotten around to doing. Mission 66, a big expansion project, was created to try and address these problems. Order 66 from Star Wars probably was not named after this project, since it has nothing at all to do with killing clones, but you never know. John D. Rockefeller Jr. would become a major player in the national park scene around this time. He was the son of the original Rockefeller, who was the richest American in history, and also the richest person in modern history. In 1926, he visited Jackson Hole, Jackson Hole is a valley in Wyoming that people had been wanting to add to Yellowstone Park for 30 years. It isn't a giant hole in the ground. Hole is a term that mountain men used to use for the mountain valley. When Rockefeller stopped by, he saw that the beautiful area was full of billboards and hot dog stands. This disgusted him so much that he decided to just buy the whole area and then give it to the government. This kicked off what would become the first major controversy in national park history. Not everyone was happy that Rockefeller, some city slicker from the East Coast, had bought up all this land. There were ranchers, hunters, and loggers who didn't like this. When FDR turned the land into the Jackson Hole National Monument and Grand Teton National Park, a big political fight ensued. There were Western members of Congress who didn't approve and who created bills to abolish the monument. Not only that, but they wanted to get rid of the president's authority to make national monuments at all. A bill to get rid of the monument passed Congress in 1944. But FDR just vetoed it. FDR pointed out that before him, presidents from both parties had created tons of national monuments, 82 to be exact, and some of them were even bigger than Jackson Hole. Despite this, the whole issue still ended up in court, where the Department of Justice decided that FDR's decision was legal. A compromise was worked out and later appeared in legislation signed into existence by President Truman in 1950. Jackson Hole National Monument and the old Grand Teton National Park were combined into new Grand Teton National Park. Some hunting would still be allowed, which appeased the locals. New laws were also put in place to prevent making new national parks in Wyoming in the future without congressional authorization. Clearly, the state of Wyoming didn't want to deal with this whole thing again anytime soon. In the 60s, new categories were created to group things in with the national parks. The first national lake shores were created in 1966 when parts of the coastline of the Great Lakes, because if every shore was entirely super expensive rental properties, nobody would ever be able to go to the beach. National heritage areas were created to preserve areas that had a major cultural impact on the history of the United States. The Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail, which runs through Virginia, Maryland, and Washington, D.C., is one such place. It mostly traces the Potomac River, which is best known for being the dividing line between the Union and the Confederacy during the Civil War. The entire state of Tennessee is also technically a national heritage area, known as the Tennessee Civil War Heritage Area. So even if you're just in your room, you're still in a heritage area, legally speaking. If you're a Tennessean, you don't even have to get out of bed to visit a national heritage area. Even if you don't live in Tennessee, you might not have to go way out into the wilderness to visit a national park. Some of them are actually inside of cities. Under Richard Nixon, two parks were created in urban areas. Golden Gate National Recreation Area in San Francisco and Gateway National Recreation Area in New York City. Both of these places were created to give the city some open space, not to preserve some specific thing. If this video has inspired you at all, then perhaps you should look up which national parks are near you. 
And if you're interested in seeing more rad history videos, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.